Since COVID, especially when we're outdoors, we don't pass offering plates or buckets or baskets. I thank you for your faithfulness in giving. You've found other ways to do that digitally through the website and the apps. I thank you for that. Apart from your faithfulness in giving, we can't do this. So, But the, the, what we have discovered is that the corporate prayers of God's people change things in a significant way. And so we never want to come together and miss the opportunity to pray with and for one another. So can we ask the Lord to do something this coming week that's beyond expectation? With the voices that are coming and the doorways that the Lord will open, that it will be a part of what he's doing in the earth. God is shaking the earth. I sat at a table a couple of miles from the border of Gaza last week with a secular Israeli friend, and he looked at me, and he made the physical symbol. He said, God is shaking us. And I said, I believe it, but I believe he's shaking the whole earth. And we want to be the group that are awakened out of that. And so that's our prayer that this week God will use our simple efforts and add to that his purposes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this congregation, for the people in this place, for their willingness to serve in this community and beyond. And Lord, we lift up the activities in the days ahead, the teenagers that are out tonight. Lord, I pray that while I have this retreat, that you would minister to them in power and authority. Give them a revelation of yourself. And for those that will gather throughout this week, Lord, we ask for outcomes that only you could bring, far beyond presentations or speeches or books or ideas, that by your spirit, you would give us understanding that the scales would fall from our eyes, that a spirit of the fear of the Lord and humility would come upon us in greater measure than we've ever known before, that we would be willing to take our place as children of the King, as ministers of reconciliation, with a message for our generation that will allow your purposes to break forth and secure a future for our children and our grandchildren. We thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, tell some of the people near you, the ones that didn't come in your car, that you're glad they're here and they look a little chilly. you received an outline if you're on campus when you came on. If you're joining us digitally or someplace else, you can download that same outline from the apps or the websites. It will have the scriptures we're going to use. That will be helpful. We've been working through a series under the general theme that God is moving, and I believe that is an accurate statement, that God is moving in the earth, not because God always moves in the earth and God's always up to something, but I believe in a unique sense. In, the, in a sense of the fulfillment of portions of Scripture, we can see God moving in the earth. I'm not adding to that some apocalyptic or eschatological perspective. I'm simply saying we're living in a season when without question, the Spirit of God is moving in unique and profound ways. I believe He is the initiator of the changes that we see around us. I believe He's preparing a people for Himself, a church without spot or blemish then I also believe he's establishing the Jewish people in their historic homeland that he promised to Abram way back in the book of Genesis. And he will do it in spite of the consternation of the United Nations or the academic elites in this nation. I think in the shaking, something's being exposed, the degree to which the spirit of Antichrist has flourished in American academia. And I believe we're going to have to prayerfully and intentionally begin to see that there's another worldview that flourishes in our educational systems. We cannot abandon our young people to the ideas that they're being subjected to. I'm a church. I'll stay polite. But in spite of that, the Lord is doing the most remarkable things. And I hope you're watching for those and listening for those and aware of those. I assure you what God is doing is more profound than anything evil is about. Now, evil doesn't typically get clicks or sell as many papers. I'm, I'm sorry, what God is doing doesn't get as many clicks or sell as many papers. So most of the headlines and most of the clickbait leads you towards expressions of darkness or evil or perversion. 
But I assure you, God is moving. A week ago today, about the time we finished church, I went home and turned on the television. We just returned from Jerusalem on Friday, and I saw the missiles from Iran headed towards Jerusalem in the land of Israel. Looked like a fireworks display. It was really, it's the first time in modern history we have seen the nation of Iran launch a direct attack on the state of Israel. Heretofore, they have used their proxies like Hamas or Hezbollah or others. The names change, but Iran stays behind them as the funding and the motivation. But someone shared a report with me this week. There was a testimony about what God is doing, and I thought it was good enough. I want to share it with you. It's not firsthand experience. I didn't talk to this scientist. Someone shared it with me. So I, you're the third person in the loop. But it seems credible with what I know of what happened a week ago tonight. It was a message that a physics professor wrote to his rabbi in Israel. He said, I wanted to share with the rabbi something that is much more than a feeling. That on Shabbat, Shabbat in Israel begins at sundown on Friday and continues until sundown on Saturday. So on Shabbat night, something happened here on the scale of the splitting of the Red Sea. I'm a doctor of physics, and I worked for several years in the defense industry in Israel in projects that are still cutting edge for the state of Israel. When I look at what happened on Saturday night on a scientific level, it simply cannot happen. Everyone, and I mean everyone, acted as one person in overall unity. He continued in the letter, the likelihood that everything works out just as it should does not exist in complex systems like the defense systems that we're operating. They have never, and I mean never, even beyond the state of Israel, been tried in real time. So I took a pencil and dove into the calculations to check the likelihood that such a result would materialize. The large number of events that had to be handled at precisely the right time doubles the chance of making a mistake. With all the high technologies, the expectation was for a breach in the defense of the skies of the state of Israel. Even if we got 90% protection, it would be a miracle. What happened, though, is that everyone, and again, he said, I mean everyone, the pilots, the system operators, the technology operators, they acted as one person at one moment in total unity. He said, if this isn't an act of God, then I no, no longer know what a miracle is. If you know anything of Israeli history, what he says next is pretty remarkable. He said, this is sharper than the victory on the Six-Day War or the War of Independence. There it could be explained according to nature. The rescue that took place for the people of Israel on Shabbat night is simply impossible, naturally. I believe that this miracle saved the lives of many people from the land of Israel. If the defense system had failed to intercept a number of cruise missiles, the result would have dragged us into a very complex campaign. I wouldn't bet that the next time it will work like this without divine supervision. The simple proof of what I said is that the managers of the security industries who develop and manufacture the systems will guarantee no more than a 90% success. And then he quotes the scripture. Since the days that you came out of the land of Egypt, you have shown your wonder, you, we have been shown your wonderful things. So God is moving. Even in places where the scientists tell us God is moving. And I assure you he's moving in Middle Tennessee or wherever your home is, just as certainly as he was standing over the skies of Jerusalem and the land of Israel last Saturday. Our God is faithful. And in this session, I want to walk through with you under the kind of a subheading, some lessons in listening. We've been using Gideon from the book of Judges as something of a, of a template for our learning. And I want to continue that. Throughout Scripture, perhaps the single most consistent characteristic of the people of God throughout the Old Testament or the New is that they listen to his voice. Hebrew is an ancient language. It's simple in many ways. To add emphasis, they, they will duplicate a verb. And there are multiple places in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, where it says, listen, listening. It means listen carefully. Listen using both ears. Pay attention. So if you'll, if you'll just spend a few minutes with me, we're going to go to listening class. You willing? Anybody live with someone who doesn't listen? 
My wife did not raise her hand. I've told this story before, but it's probably worth repeating. I was watching a ball game. It's been a while, much long ago. I'm a changed person. And Kathy had something she wanted to tell me, and she's, she was standing kind of on the edge of the room, and she began to talk, and I think she could probably, she noticed I wasn't paying close attention. She stepped into the room, kind of between me and the television, so I had to keep eye contact. But I had the remote. So while she's talking, I'm just gradually raising the volume. But the TV I had at that time, I have an upgraded model. There was a little dial on the screen. You could, little, you could see the, room, the volume level. She's clever. She turned around and saw it on the screen, and I was so busted. Sometimes we do that to the Lord. We want him to speak to us. We want him to do it during the commercial break. All right? We want to know what God has for us, but we would like him to fit it into the 10 minutes where there's not something else we would rather do. And I want to suggest that that's not the most helpful process in your home or with the Lord. And so with God's help, we're going to unpack this a little bit. I introduced you to an idea some time ago, watch, listen, think, and act. I think it's still a significant way to navigate the world around us. Uh, the, the institutions where we had such great trust seem to have forfeited a great deal of that. It's hard to know what to believe or what to trust. The prophet Isaiah said that truth has stumbled in the street. And I think that's an accurate description of what we watch these days around us. So watching and listening, thinking, and then acting on what you're watching and seeing is a very important habit to develop. You want it to become the routine with which you're navigating life. And I'll start in Judges 6 and verse 7. It says, the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian. He sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I'm the Lord, your God. Don't worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Some of you remember the passage just in front of that. It says that God handed the Israelites over to their enemies. And the message he sent to them when they cried out to him, they cried out to him, and God said, I sent you messengers. I sent you a, a word. I tried to communicate with you, and you wouldn't listen. You were too busy. You lived in a promised land. You had a covenant. You worshiped me. You offered sacrifices. You had priests, but you wouldn't listen. So our first component in lessons in listening is to recognize within yourself that there are consequences of ignoring God. If you're not willing to listen, if you're consciously putting your fingers in your ears and humming, if you're turning up the volume, you can sit in church and not listen. You can read your Bible and have no intention of cooperating. You can be very religious and still be very rebellious. I want us to understand from a biblical perspective, there is a consequence when we refuse to listen. Let's not be that people in this very unique season. Let's decide to cultivate our listening skills. There's an importance in listening to God. How do you do that? You know, in the book of Judges, it said God sent a prophet. How do we, what does it mean for you and me to listen to God in the most practical ways? I grew up in a barn in Tennessee. I'm pretty simple. I think it starts with the scripture. You have to spend time on a regular basis systematically reading your Bible. Some days you'll pick it up and it will seem dry and empty and there's absolutely little relevance to you. And there's other days you'll pick it up and it'll feel like it was written to you. It happens to me. But in the willingness to submit to the discipline, the habit, the pattern, to present yourself to the Lord and say, I'm going to open this book. I believe there's an authority in it that comes from the throne of God. And I'll present myself to you as one who wants to learn. If you will cultivate that habit, God will respond to you. If you don't like it, if you don't like the book, tell him the truth. He can handle it. He knows you're thinking it anyway. I have found it is much more fruitful to be honest with the Lord than to imagine I'm fooling him. 
Say, Lord, I would like to understand. I would like to know you better. It begins with the word of God. It extends as you get to know his character. As you read through the word of God, you'll begin to get glimpses into the character of God. He's not like what you think. The, the Bible does not describe for us an eternal church service with one preacher after another. Hallelujah. I'll say it for you. But you'll begin to get to know God's character. You'll become familiar with the fruit of the Spirit of God. What does it look like? What are the characteristics? What are the components when God is present? We need to know that. Because it isn't about religious language or religious activity or the supernatural. The Antichrist, that individual that will ultimately rule this world for a brief season, will be a very religious, very supernatural character. And if you think just religious language or religious architecture or even the supernatural are expressions of the Spirit of God, you can be very easily manipulated and deceived. What we want to learn is to recognize the fruit of God's Spirit. It takes humility and submission to listen. To listen means I'm not trying to assert my perspective, nor am I so consumed with my circumstances that I have to make them known to you. So often when we take time in the presence of the Lord, we want him to hear about our problems and do something. But learning to listen to the Lord means I simply would like to be in your presence. I'll take some time with your word. I'll, I'll put on some worship music and enjoy the imaginations that the Spirit of God is present with me. I want to learn what it means to be with the people of God. And if you don't enjoy that, if that's uncomfortable for you, if it's awkward, if it's frustrating, that's a very important place to begin. I have discovered something. If I want to learn to fish, I need to hang out with people who are better at fishing than I am. If I want to learn to hunt turkeys in Tennessee, I need to hang out with people that are turkey hunters. Hanging out at the frozen food section in the grocery store will not make me a better turkey hunter. I can go home with turkey, but it won't be the same. And if the imagination of being in the presence of the Lord holds little appeal for you, have the courage to say to the Lord, you know, I haven't been that interested. It hasn't mattered that much to me. Again, the honesty, the integrity of the desire for a relationship with God will exponentially change the, the, the tone of, of what God will do in your life. Listening matters. In John 10 and verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Pretty simple stuff. My sheep listen to my voice. They know me. Folks, we've got to learn to recognize what God is doing. We are too easily manipulated. We're too vulnerable. There's too much foolishness in the church that gets wrapped up in God language or the Lord said, and it has little to do with the Spirit of God or the character of God. Amen. Matthew 3 and verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. This is an interesting notion, this, what comes from the presence of the Spirit of God. The Bible describes as fruit. The fruit on a tree is dramatically different than the ornaments on a Christmas tree. If you see a beautifully decorated Christmas tree, you didn't think, oh, somebody really fertilized that. Somebody sprayed all the insects. You understand immediately that somebody did something to decorate that tree completely apart from the integrity or the health of the tree. On the other hand, if you pick fruit from a tree and the fruit is of good quality and it's delicious, you understand the tree is healthy. Well, the Bible talks to us about the Spirit of God bringing fruitfulness to our lives. In Ephesians 5 and verse 8, once you were in darkness, but now you're in the light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness. Again, I like simple things. I want to live with the notion that my light is bearing fruit that reflects the participation with God in my life. Then I want to avoid things that are fruitless in God's economy. If God says they don't have value, that he doesn't approve, that he's not interested, even if I'm attracted, even if I have an interest, 
I want to cultivate the habit. I want to implement the discipline that says I will not give my time or energy to things that God says is fruitless. I believe that will become increasingly important in what's before us. There's a third component of developing our listening skills, of watching and listening and thinking and being prepared to act. We have to both watch and understand. Understanding requires some insight. In Judges chapter 6, it says, An angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak that belonged to Joash, it's Gideon's father, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. In those two verses, two things are reported. They're separate. They're related, but they're separate. It says, An angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak tree. We don't know how long he was there. We don't know what he observed. We simply know he took a place under an oak tree. But then in the 12th verse, it says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said something to him. The Lord is with you. That intrigues me. It doesn't say the angel came and sat down under the oak tree and spoke to Gideon. It at least seems to me to be implied that the angel was there for a bit before Gideon, he was revealed to Gideon. So I want to plant a seed. I want to submit to you that God is moving around your life and around my life, that there are angels involved in our journey that we're not yet aware of. So the question is, are you watching for God's involvement? You see, it's so easy for me or for you to focus on the disappointments, the discouraging things, the ungodly things, the things I don't like or the things I don't agree with. They get pumped towards us all the time. They cascade over our, our awareness. It takes more discipline and intentionality to watch and listen for what God is doing. It's a different way to live in the world. You don't need to spend hours a day focused on the news report. They've got about an eight-minute loop. They just repeat. Take 10 or 12 minutes. You can listen to it one and a half times. You got the news for the day. Spend the rest of the day thanking God that he's moving in the earth, that he has assignments for you, that he's engaged with you, that there is hope for your future, that our security isn't related to the Federal Reserve or the strength of the dollar, that our children have hope beyond the president of the teachers' unions. That would have been a good place for an amen, but it's okay. You just hang in there. Hebrews 13, 2 says, don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Practice hospitality. You'll get to entertain some angels. Well, I don't like people. Change. <laughs> Be kind to the people who serve you in a restaurant. Be generous. Be kind to the people whose names you're never expected to know. The people that you interact with at a grocery store or at a, a, a quick mart. The people that you bump into through the course of your day. Listen to them. Treat them with dignity and respect. You never know the appointments God has arranged for you. Behave as if you're an ambassador for the king. Say, I'm busy. I've got a lot to think. I know. I know. I know busy people. But determined to take the events of your day as a series of divinely arranged appointments. I believe if you'll do that, you will find God's engagement in your life is far more frequent and far more prevalent than you've been willing to consider. All right, watch and understand. Number four, when we're listening for the Lord, he'll provide confirmation. When God gives you direction... God will confirm it for you. Now, you don't need confirmation for the fundamental truths which are presented in Scripture. You don't need God to confirm what moral and immoral is. He's told us that in the plainest of language. God said he created us male and female. You don't need that to be confirmed for you. So don't be so spiritual that you're no earthly good. God's defined marriage for us. He's, defined, he's warned us about gluttony. He's warned us about drunkenness. We don't, need any, we don't need God to tell us what to do with our resources. He told us the first tenth belongs to him. We have a lot of instruction. We don't need confirmation of that. 
but in the specific responses to the seasons that we walk through in life, the challenges that come, when God is initiating changes, we need to understand how to listen and recognize his confirmation. The principle I learned as a young man has held true that big changes require big guidance. Don't make great changes because someone suggested it to you. Don't make tremendous changes in your life because you found a single verse and it just resonated with me on that day. So I sold my home and I canceled my insurance and I took my kids out of school and we don't know where we're going. That's not God. That's too much pizza. <laughs> big changes require big guidance. It's biblical in Judges 6. Gideon has had this visit with an angelic figure. But he's not done. The, the confirmations that come are multiple. Gideon replied, if I found favor in your eyes, verse 17, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'll wait. Same scenario, verse 21, with the tip of his staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire flared from the rock. And Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord. He exclaimed, Sovereign Lord, I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Up until this point, Gideon really didn't understand he was inter interacting with an angel. Until the moment had already passed. It confirmed this notion that he had. He knew he was speaking to someone who had a perspective that he didn't have himself. You see, it's so important as we begin to listen, we have the desire to hear from the Lord, not to be weird. I, I really have little patience with weird Christians. Weird does not make you spiritual. It just makes you weird. Do you understand the difference? If you have no gas in the tank of your car, you don't need a word from the Lord. You need a filling station and cash or a place to plug in your EV. Again, it's, it's a very important principle. I've seen too many people, I have shed tears over people I cared about who've been manipulated with spiritual language. You don't have to be weird to follow the Lord. But if you have a desire to know him and you'll present yourself to him and you'll become familiar with what the fruit of the Spirit of God looks like, it's not hidden. It's clearly described for us in Scripture. It can be recognized. If you'll do that, you'll begin to recognize God's involvement. Now, why that's important is that momentum matters. Momentum matters in physics. Momentum matters in business. Momentum matters in athletics. And I assure you, momentum matters in your spiritual formation. The verses I just read to you are from Judges 6, 21 and 22. In, verse six, in chapter 6, verse 25, it says, The same night... The same night that Gideon is aware that he's had an angelic encounter, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that's seven years old. Do you know God knows the ages of the livestock in the field? Some of you think you've been fooling God. He knows how old your goldfish is. I bet he can keep up with us. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. There is a momentum which grows as you follow the Lord. It did in Gideon's life, and it will in yours. In a very similar way, there's a momentum which grows if you follow your old carnal desires, and you give yourself license. You'll become increasingly sloppy in your spiritual life. In that same chapter, in verse 36, Gideon's asking for more confirmation. In fact, it's become a metaphor for for the people of faith through the centuries about Gideon's fleece. Gideon rather apologetically says, Lord, you know, I'm sorry, but I, would, could you confirm this assignment? Because it's impossible. It wasn't like God had asked Gideon to do something that he was capable of. The assignment's impossible. And he said, you know, I, I'm willing, I'm listening. I'll, I, I've cut down some altars and I'm already hated by the community. But if this is really you, and the expression is Gideon put out a fleece, but what he prayed was he said, let me put a, uh, the, the fleece of a lamb on the ground and let the ground be dry and the fleece be wet. And when he was awakened in the morning, that's what happened. 
And it says that he wrung the fleece out and there was a bowl full of water. But Gideon wasn't satisfied. He said, Lord, if it's you, I want you to confirm that for me tomorrow. Let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. And God complied. Two times Gideon went back to the Lord and asked for confirmation beyond everything he had received. I would submit to you as an expression of God's grace, his unmerited, his undeserved, certainly his unearned favor towards us, and his patience. God knows we're frail. He knows we're cracked pots. He knows our inconsistencies. God knows our limits. And in this passage, it's so clear to me that as we're trying to learn to listen and to walk new pathways and to accept new responses, that God displays grace and patience. Two times Gideon's asked for, asks for affirmation. I would submit to you it's much better to learn to recognize God's direction in your life, his spirit within you, than to pray for those kind of physical confirmations. I've heard all sorts of weird stories. Lord, if you want me to do it, let this happen or that happen. My Bible says that those that are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We have a unique advantage over those persons in the Old Covenant. The New Testament, the revelation, the great revelation of the New Testament beyond the redemptive work of Jesus is the Spirit of God lives within you and me, that he no longer lives in a temple built with human hands, but that you and I have become the temple of the living God. That if you've made a profession of faith in Jesus, his spirit lives within you. And what we want to learn to do is recognize his prompts, his encouragement, his direction, to know the difference between what comes from him and what comes from my old carnal self. It's a powerful revelation. So I'm not encouraging you to cultivate Gideon's practice of asking God for a physical sign. I'm encouraging you to recognize what the presence of God's Spirit looks like in your life and in the lives of the people you're dealing with. Ultimately, the evidence of obedience, the evidence of listening in your life, how do you know somebody's listening to the Lord? They're obedient to him. Gideon gives expression to that in Judges 7. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, announce to the people, anyone who trembles with fear can turn back. So 22,000 men left. Two-thirds of the army left. Gideon said, listen, if anybody's afraid, go home. All the smart people went home. They're outnumbered 10 to 1 at least. They're, the technology of their enemy is greater than what they have. So Gideon says to the force that's gathered for the battle, if you're afraid, go home. If you're not afraid, you don't understand. It's very important that Gideon was willing to let his force be reduced in obedience to what God was saying. He's listening. The evidence in my life, the evidence in your life, that you listen to the Lord isn't your ability to quote something or to use spiritual vocabulary words. It's obedience in your life. The alignment between your life and the authority of God's word is the best evidence I know that you're listening to him. It's so important. Two times God tells Gideon to reduce his force. Two times. The group is whittled down to 300 people. The objective never changes. God said, I'm going to deliver the Israelites from this overwhelming army. The objective has never changed, but the methods are directed by God at each interval. It was true in the book of Judges, and it's true in the 21st century, wherever you live. God's objective in the earth is that the name of Jesus be lifted up, his kingdom extended. That every person have a privilege of hearing the truth. He's preparing a church, a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's establishing the Jewish people in a homeland that he promised to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. God's purposes haven't changed. They're not evolving. But the methods, we have to receive his direction to understand how we walk in this season. I'll give you one last piece. In Judges chapter 7, the battle is imminent. The 300 that God has given to Gideon are prepared. They're equipped with the tools that they've been told to take. It's the night before battle is to begin. 
And it's such a powerful expression of the kindness of God towards people who will listen. I want you to know that if you have a desire to listen to the Lord, that there's a mercy expressed towards you that I don't believe comes any other way. The kindness that God shows to Gideon on this night is truly remarkable to me. It's chapter 7 and verse 9. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up and go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp. Listen to what they're saying. Afterward, you'll be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and his servant went down to the outposts. After all the prompts from the Lord, after prophetic messages, after angelic visits, after a fleece that was wet and a fleece that was dry, after God whittling down the forest, after all that God has done, it's the night before battle, and Gideon is both afraid and discouraged by the nature of the enemy. The Lord knows it. He says to him, if you're afraid to attack, let me tell you what you can do. God's acknowledging the battle within him that Gideon is having. The problem seems greater than his ability or his resources. That's important, folks. God's going to ask you and me to stand in places that exceed our energy, our strength, our wisdom, our experience, the resources that we have for the problem. He'll put us in places where we need outcomes, and we understand fundamentally we are powerless to deliver the outcome. The question is, will we be obedient in that place? Will we say to God, recruit somebody else? I'm not interested. I'm not going to pray for the people where I work. I'm not going to pray for the school where my children go. I'm not praying for the neighborhood where I live. Are we willing to be salt and light in all of those places? I'm not going to stand up and say I'm an advocate for the Jewish people in the nation of Israel. It's unpopular in too many settings. I don't want to be divisive. Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring division. And we're going to have to have the courage to choose the truth, the kindness of God. Gideon, if you're afraid, I know you're discouraged. Go down to the camp. You can be free of fear and you can be encouraged. God doesn't criticize. He offers a way to overcome both his fear and his discouragement. The reality of the circumstance, it's an impossible assignment. You know, our reality, apart from God, a great outcome for our lives is not just improbable, it's impossible. We live in a broken world, a fallen world. Evil exists. And it doesn't just intend to limit you or diminish you. The objective of evil is your destruction. And you and I are weak, we're frail, we're limited. In our understanding and our awareness, we have a default position that is selfish. The only hope we have is that there's an almighty God. And he loves us and he cares for us. And he will help us. It's the revelation of Scripture that we're not alone that we can be forgiven of our mistakes, we can be cleansed of our past, that we have a helper who will lead and guide and direct us on the most improbable journey. It's a message of incredible hope. The question, the ultimate question that will determine outcomes is are we listening? Do we intend to hear? Do we really want to understand? Is our objective to cooperate? Well, I want to close with a prayer. I want to pray for those who've been ignoring God. If you have the courage to say it to yourself, I haven't been interested. I wanted God to bless me, but I didn't really want to be bothered with what he wanted. I just wanted to know the winning lottery numbers. I want to pray for those who have the courage and the humility and the honesty to say they've been ignoring God. And then I'd like to pray for those who are willing to hear, to invest effort in listening, not just during the commercial breaks, but that you will actually begin to seek the Lord. If you're in either one of those categories, I'm going to ask you to stand really quickly. We're going to pray. I'm done. We're going to worship the Lord. You can move more when Matt's singing. Be careful. If you present yourself to the Lord, I believe he takes you seriously. The only thing that may be more unsettling than God not saying anything to you is if you begin to understand what God is saying. I have found him not to be the great maintainer of the status quo. Hallelujah. You ready to pray? You want to take somebody's hand? 
You have to drop your blanket, won't you? That's not a good plan. I'm sorry. I just created havoc. If you don't know the person's hands you've got, introduce yourself. If they won't talk to you, turn loose of them. Their prayer won't help. See, it wasn't just you that was cold. Your neighbor's cold, too. Feel those little frigid fingers. Oh, Father, thank you for your word, for the truth that it presents to us, the invitation that it holds. I thank you that in every generation, you have a message for your people, that you haven't left us alone, that you haven't withdrawn for us. Lord, that even when our own stubbornness, we are walking through consequences of our own, that we have contributed to, that you move on our behalf in grace and mercy. And we come tonight to repent. Lord, many of us have not been listening. Or we've issued some demands and occasionally a request. But we've had little interest in listening. Forgive us tonight. Give us understanding hearts. Begin to give us a new hunger and a thirsting for the things of God. Give us a joy when we're in the presence of your people that we've never known. Lord, all of us stand tonight to say, to present ourselves before you as living sacrifices. I ask you to give us insight and understanding beyond our years, our experience. Lord, lead us and direct us. May we recognize what you're doing, to recognize the fruit of your spirit in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in the places we work, the factories and the job sites, Lord, wherever they may be. May we be a generation of men and women who have been willing to listen to the voice of a living God and act upon the truth that you've made known. Holy Spirit, help us. We thank you for it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.